Glory to Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Orthodox Ethos YouTube channel, and thank you for visiting or being a subscriber. The interview you're about to watch took place at the inaugural conference of the Uncut Mountain Press and is a part of a larger offering of tremendous material by leading Orthodox speakers, clergymen, writers, publishers. We want to encourage you to take advantage of the entire offering over at orthodoxethos.com. Go over there and register, take part in the forum, take advantage of the blog and the reading list, and the entire video library, live streaming, PDF, all of the material that's there, in addition to all of the lectures from the conference. You won't regret it. This is just one part of a larger treasure of material that will edify and strengthen and inspire you. God bless. Vladika, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this Orthodox Ethos podcast and at the conference that we just finished last week from the Uncle Mountain Press. It was a joy and an honor to have you with us for uh, those two days, pray together and to uh, speak to the faithful about the importance of the Orthodox Ethos. We're very grateful that you joined us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. But uh, my impression was that concerning <clears throat> an orthodox ethos, I acquaint that with simply orthodox piety. And the gathering of the people there seemed to be, um, perhaps the majority of them were from uh, converts to orthodoxy and others in the faith who um, were supportive of and interested in preserving what's traditional uh, in orthodoxy in a atmosphere now that is rapidly changing uh, and is affecting even the approach towards orthodox piety, that is orthodox, an orthodox lifestyle. So the, the talks and the general atmosphere, I think we're there to strengthen and to direct people uh, in their piety and their, their spiritual life in a, in a traditional way. I think there was a general understanding among everybody that was at the at the conference yes yes it was a oneness of mind there oneness of heart people were very encouraged and so we're grateful that you were uh kind of overseen uh, from a high level uh as a bishop does uh, and uh, uh and came came to be with us so as we go forward now the question is going to be increasingly how do we not only keep the orthodox ethos for ourselves which we discussed quite a bit you gave us wonderful examples from the lives of the fathers here in the monastery and the very practical good direction but also how we might be able to help the church at large our brothers and sisters uh, maintain the orthodox ethos and 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 really to discern it in many ways because it seems to be under attack in many ways uh, would that be well, I, I think you have to, first of all, identify uh, what you're talking about. Uh, what is it exactly that you're looking for in order to establish a standard, let's say, although uh, in the Orthodox Church, we allow for variation um, from local church to local church, but there are certain things that are universal and that have been part of our experience from the very beginning studying the very earliest church history. Many of our students, when they begin to read documents from the first century, they're always very happy to see that they say, oh, this is just exactly what we're doing now. This is the way we're living now. And they read about what was going on in the first century, and they see that they're, in a way, comforted, you might say, in a way, to see that there's a, a content continuity between uh, what was going on and what's going on now uh, in the church that we preserved uh, these basics. Uh, and you have to, uh, I think, be able to identify what's important. Uh, a lot of it's the externals, uh, because we learn from the externals from practice. 
uh, and how to practice and to be able to say that uh, the certain things in order to preserve, you know, the, the first thing is to make sure people understand what's our purpose. Our purpose is to unite ourselves with God. That's the whole purpose. That's salvation. And then how is this done? Uh, well, the, the church has tried and true ways of doing this, and it's a pattern that is sanctified uh, many generations for for not just 20 centuries, but from the very beginning, um, because the church extends back to Adam and Eve, of course. And we have to make sure that that what was functioning, you might say, and uh, was an aid to and a path to salvation in the in the f recent past and and further than that is still good for us now. Unfortunately, uh, people don't understand that the church navigates itself through the times, but it doesn't uh, adapt to the times in in this in the spirit of the times. Let's say they're we're doing you know sort of technological things now, but that doesn't affect the faith at all. But it's the we have to be able to identify the spirit of the times. Our own Archbishop of Erke here, uh, that was one of his major themes, the spirit of the times. Uh, we published a book about struggling for virtue, which is basically about struggling with the spirit of the times mm. and maintaining your orthodox ethos, you might say, the mm -hmm. orthodox piety and being able to identify what's harmful. So you have to let people know uh, what is harmful for them, but also in a positive way of what they should be doing uh, with their lives. Uh, the, certain aspects of, you might even call it American orthodoxy, that m might be troublesome uh, for some. I had a conversation with our late Metropolitan, uh, Alarion, a year or so ago, where I mentioned to Ludic, I said I was concerned about some of the things that I noticed going on in certain directions uh, in the terms of the way people are catechized, uh, the way they're being uh, brought into the church, uh, perhaps not with enough emphasis on the asceticism of orthodoxy, the fasting, preparation, proper preparation uh, to receive Holy Communion, uh, their prayer life. There's an idea that we need to... Um, engage the people more uh, in order for them to participate. But no matter, I think, whatever whatever what you do, if you leave the royal gates open all the time, you have see-through iconostases or, or perhaps want to eliminate them completely in order so that people can be more engaged because they could, uh, quote unquote, see what's going on. If you have pews uh, from the back of the church right up into the ambo, there's still going to be a sense of the theater that people are watching something being performed. It's not going to engage them anymore. Mm. It's going to have uh, a deleterious effect, just the visuals themselves. It might seem minor to some, but I think it's very important because the church deals with the visuals. And you can go into one church and it will look very traditional and you can go into another church and people will just characterize it as modern looking or something like that. Well, that very much affects the person's spiritual formation. Mm -hmm. um, we have to pay attention to these things and be able to uh, live in the modern world, deal with modern issues and problems, but yet uh, still maintain the flavor of traditional orthodoxy, which some people just disparaging will you say well that's old country or that's local custom or it's a cultural thing no that's not true uh, in some ways it is but it doesn't take away at all from mm -hmm. that is how the piety of the church is transmitted through culture mm -hmm. um, the first church was very jewish uh, mm -hmm. you didn't have to be a jew to be an orthodox christian but you know the jewish piety was the basis for uh the the original the growth it still is it still is we don't realize it. We don't really pay attention to that. But it's that ethos that comes to us um, transformed by Christ and the, his holy apostles from the Old Testament that it makes a continuum from that time up until now. A, a pious Jew in the third century before Christ would feel at home in a traditional Orthodox setting mm. today, if it, except for the end you of know, the minor 
sort of externals because there's something very deep and and it's a continuity that we have to be careful not to to break that. This, this brings up a, 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 the question of assimilating for the converts, the Orthodox ethos, one of our topics in the conference. Mm. And how does one uh, put on Christ, not just in baptism, but in the whole way of the phronema and the way of life and the way of interacting? And I think we, I think you, was, you pointed out during the conference that you have to, to a certain degree, you have to come into an existing uh situation in a parish and and you don't have to become a serbian but that that's the way that things are communicated through a, a serbian or russian or greek whatever it might be that for, and this is one of my main concerns is how does an american uh thoroughly go deeper into orthodoxy and acquire the orthodox ethos the way of being and living if if they don't have the examples uh, coming down to us from generation upon generation, which means that it's going to be packaged packaged in some ethnic flavor of some sort. Well, no, I, I is that yeah, accurate? I, yeah, I, I did. I mentioned that. I said if I was suddenly transported totally into a, a Romanian a sort of situation, mm-hmm. uh, I would definitely adopt a Romanian ways uh, in order to function there yes. uh, within their context. There's no problem with that. I'm not going to, to be Romanian um, as such, although that's also a choice. Two people can become whatever they, they choose to become. Uh, they can adopt a culture. In Russia, there were many cultures uh, going on. Most of Russia was, was Asia and up until including Alaska. So ethnically, these people were not Russians. But they were Orthodox. And this is a thing that, yes, the, the, the piety, the ethos is conveyed through culture. And because culture is a way of life. And if you just come right out of a, a general American way of life, Secular it, it, well, everything that's connected to mm-hmm. uh, being an American, let's say, minus Orthodoxy, uh, it, it, Orthodoxy as such will be very abstracted from your way of life. Mm. It's just going to be uh, just going to be orthodox, but you cannot be living orthodox because what part of your your life that's totally American can be somehow assimilated into orthodoxy like the other cultures in the world were. So I think if you're in a local church, you have to be flexible enough to adopt the local customs of that given community. Um, in a way that helps you to assimilate the lifestyle which transmits the actual piety. Um, Now, this this can be done. uh, Many times Americans are afraid of losing their identity in the sense of, you know, that, well, I can't be Greek, I can't be Russian or something, or I don't want to be, because Americans are extremely independent thinking. But, you know, you can, uh, you can, adopt these things, these cultural ideas, maybe perhaps just, it could be just simply the rhythm of the services, whatever, the customs associated with the services, etc. sort of the music of the services, and you don't lose your identity, you just, you expand it. In a way, you enrich it, yes. Mm-hmm. And there shouldn't be resistance to that, because you really have nothing to offer in its place. Well, when, when, when the missionaries came from Thessaloniki, and the Russian people embraced Orthodoxy, I would assume that it took generations for them well, to simulate everything that Orthodoxy meant for the... Well, some of the early Russian bishops didn't speak Russian, they spoke Greek. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, yeah. this, is, this is not an impediment. Yeah. Um, yeah, the people need to get over this. Uh, if they really want to embrace the faith, they'll do everything they can mm-hmm. to embrace the faith. So that's one issue. Of course, it's more than we can discuss here and how sure. that could possibly be done. But it can be done, and who knows, over a period of time, maybe certain little things in an American way of life can be assimilated into orthodoxy, can enter into them, and they can become sanctified through practice Mm. or something along those lines. But that again, that takes a a long period of time. In in the case of Russia, Russia has – Russia – did not have and has no culture whatsoever, has nothing, doesn't even have an alphabet without orthodoxy. Other cultures, they were very developed in the pagan periods, etc. But as far as the Russian situation is concerned, there is just nothing. There, it doesn't exist. Orthodoxy gave Russia its life that, as we know it. 
it's almost laughable to mm -hmm. think about what was the culture before 988 in Russia. It was very, even the paganism was very primitive. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't as well developed in Greece as in Greece and Rome, etc. So, but that's a different story. I mean, America already has a basis. It's it's a basis in Protestantism. Uh, some Roman Catholic uh, mm -hmm. thing has entered into, you know, St. Patrick's Day or something mm -hmm. like that. Who knows? But again, it, it, people have to be more flexible. They need to, orthodoxy has to be, from the time you wake up in the morning time you go to bed at night, has to enter, enter, enter into everything. If you really believe it's everything, then it should be everything in your mm -hmm. life. It has to be. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it just become part of your life. It's just your religion mm -hmm. or so. And then it, it's not really affecting you. Uh, it's not really changing you. It's not... It's not the rhythm of your everyday life. It has to be the rhythm of your everyday life. Can we talk a little bit about uh, the whole question of, of bringing in uh, when somebody wants to become an Orthodox Christian and how they become Orthodox today in the missionary setting? I know that here in the Russian Orthodox Church abroad, uh, from the 1970s on, there's been a conscious decision on the holy part of the Holy Synod that the converts should be received by baptism, and that here at the monastery, that's the norm and the practice. Mm. Why is that so important? Well, first of all, uh, it, why wouldn't you baptize somebody? Because it, it, it's clear in the gospel and uh, in, in the Holy Fathers that baptism is necessary for salvation. That's very clear from the words of the Lord and the practice of the church. There exists economia, but another word, a similar word uh, for economia is, economia is exception. So there's the church allows for an exception to the rule if an exception is necessary. Why? That's what the nature of an exception is. It's, you need to use an exception because of the, if, if the practice is impossible, then you use an exception to get the results. So if an entire town or village in Italy uh, decides to become Orthodox, it probably would be problematic to herd them all down to the local river and to baptize them all uh, for various reasons. So it might be possible to use some kind of economia, but in individual cases, w why not baptize a person? There's no need not to baptize a person. Mm -hmm. uh, out of a hundred people that I've baptized, not a single one has ever come back and said, that was a mistake. I should have been chrismated. No. But on the other hand, there are people that have been chrismated that have come back and said, I should have been baptized. So mm -hmm. if there's no need, then the issue to the fullness, there'll be no question at the end of mm -hmm. the day. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are situations you might have uh, that, uh, and we allow for that in the church abroad. We allow for a decision to be made to chrismate a person to find another means to unite them to the church. But if there's no reason not to, then of course we baptize them. Mm -hmm. And then the question is settled. And and, and it also has a sense of finality to it as well, mm -hmm. because as long as a person keeps thinking that, well, I was baptized as a Presbyterian or something like that, and now I've just been united to orthodoxy, so there's something almost lacking. But if you, if you even cut that out of their sort of spiritual mm -hmm. profile or something, say, no, uh, we do believe in one baptism for remission of sins, but we really need to put that in parentheses. We have to say, I believe in one orthodox baptism for the remission of sins, mm -hmm. because clearly the Holy Fathers were not justifying baptism outside of the church at the time, mm -hmm. because they were dealing with, of course, since day one with heresies mm -hmm. and breaks with the community of the church. Uh, and one baptism is one baptism, but it's within the orthodox context. This, so so th this has to be, of course, it's being done for various reasons, which I'm not going to go into here, but why use an exception if there's no need for the exception? Right. Uh, besides all the other reasons why uh, the mystery should be uh, performed as it's been handed down to us. Well, as you indicated, uh, you implied there that, that there are, this is connected to the whole question of ecclesiology. Well, well, but that's the whole, one of the problems is that one of the biggest problems in orthodoxy of the 20th century is ecclesiology. Mm. It, it's the boundaries of the church. Exactly where is the church mm. and where is the church not? And of course, this is what created and what's given a lot of strength to ecumenism, where the boundaries of the church are being erased, if not completely erased. And more and more statements are coming out that are very confusing to the people. Mm. They're not really quite sure 
what it is to be really in the church or not in the church. And then recently statements were made in, in Finland about, you know, that Lutheran baptism is equal to Orthodox baptism. And people are very confused by this. Would you agree to that and agree that the, 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 the Eucharist in the, in the Lutheran church is equal to the Orthodox Eucharist? And people say, well, no, that's not true, but the baptism is. So in essence, you're saying that the Holy Spirit is regenerating and sanctifying and working in Lutheran baptism, but it's not working in any other of the mysteries or the sacraments of the Lutherans. That's what you're actually saying. So in a way, it's, it's, it's an absurdity mm -hmm. because then there's all, this, uh, there's all this dialogue going on and explanations, et cetera. And we're, we're completely, totally aware of the of the patristic legacy involved and the literature uh, talking about this and one can argue in this way, but again, it comes down to exceptions. And especially because of the climate now, because people don't know, they're confused as to what's in the church, what's not in the church. Um, it has to do with salvation. Uh, outside of the church, there's no salvation. That's been established by the fathers, um, et cetera. And of course, that leads to all kinds of other discussions. But ecclesiology is, is so even many Protestants say that's one of our weakest points because we don't define where the church is. Community of believers. Community of believers, and then you ask believers, what do they believe? And they will believe something different. Mm. You know, so what does that mean? Where's the unity there? Where's the truth there? It's, it's extremely confusing. And we have to define every community, every household, all has its rules. And it's the way you run the organization, you run the family by certain rules. If you want to be in that family, if you want to be in that organization, you need to follow the rules. But in religion, let's say in a general sense or in orthodoxy, they're allowing for more and more you know, exceptions to this rule or a different understanding, different interpretation of this, these rules. You wouldn't allow this in your own house because you say these are our rules. But in the church, they expect us to be keep beginning. Elastic. Yeah, yeah right. more flexible, more flexible, more understanding, more love. They'll use the word, of course, who understands what love means? If you want to really, I'm not going to begin to preach about love, but one way of seeing how much you really do love is to read what St. Paul said. Read that list. Use that as a litmus test. If you say you love somebody, if you love something, see those six or seven things what St. Paul says is love. doesn't seek its own. It's not jealous, etc. cetera. And if you, if you fall into it, you don't love. This is something you need to work on. And he's very specific about that. Uh, Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He doesn't say, have a gushy feeling about me. Mm. You know, this is not what it's about. Mm. It's deeds. It's the way you live, the way you act, the way you interrelate. That's what it's about. Recently, uh, we, as we discussed at the conference, we had the honor uh, to publish at Anka Mountain Press a new book on the dogma of the church by St. Hilarion Trotsky. Mm -hmm. you, you expressed a lot of joy at, the, oh, yes. at this publication. Why well, are you so I was here? glad to see. I was acquainted with that book when I first came here, uh, and of course in the Russian version, and we had copies of it here in the monastery, and because of this question of ecclesiology, and St. Hilarion, of course, that's his major, his major theme, and the, the theme of the boundaries of the church, the dogma of the church. And it, it, it was clearly a foundational text, but it, it was very daunting because it's a, a very, it's a, a thick text with ext an extreme amount of uh, very erudite footnotes. I think you said there's 2,000 footnotes mm -hmm. and in at least four or five or maybe six different languages. Mm -hmm. And the idea of finding somebody to do that kind of translation it, overwhelming, the cost, etc. And I always was hoping that eventually, we even brought it up at a publications meeting, when we heard that you did it, we were sort of like in a sort of a good way jealous. We said, well, we should have done that. Mm. Well, we knew that it difficult um, to do something like that. And of course, there's, without getting into history lessons here, uh, about the whole movement of ecclesiology in the Russian church from the 19th century uh, through uh, Alexei Homyakov, up through the new martyrs and confessors of Russia, they themselves were very much trained in the academies about the dogma of the church. Mm. Uh, and of course, St. Hilarion was one of the major proponents of this. This was his major theme. Mm. And it made the vast majority of the new martyrs and confessors of Russia capable 
of discerning the difficulties with what mm. we call surgingism, mm. which was a very fine point for most people, but it was only because they had already been introduced to this concept of how important it is to define where the church is. Yes. So that is precisely why when surgingism as such appeared on the scene, they were prepared in many ways to be able to discern. It was, of course, an agonizing choice to make because under the Bolsheviks, if you were Orthodox, that was the first reason to kill you or to imprison you. And then, then it became, what church do you go to? What mm -hmm. church do you belong to? You know, they had the renovationists, which was also an ecclesiological yes. question, and they were able to defeat that too. Yes. Uh, and then be, be, it was because the dogma of the church was strong among the educated clergy. And of course, now it's not so much. Or unfortunately, there are some insidious elements entering into the Orthodox Church now that undermined the dogma of the church and our understanding of the boundaries. They would rather not have people talk about that because they want to be all inclusive. But that's not the position. It's never been the position of the, either the Holy Apostles or their descendants up until recent times. So that book in itself, of course, it's a daunting thing to read. It's long, and it's, uh, you have, if you use the footnotes, but it's important. We we publish a shorter uh, booklet where we're republishing now Christianity or the Church, also by Saint Hilarion, um, which can help people uh, to stay more loyal to and devoted to uh, the Church itself, because when it gets watered down, when the when the boundaries get erased, that's when people become indifferent, mm. you know, and then that's when they're, you know, quite frankly, they're, they're, their orthodox faith begins to change mm. into something else. It uh, begins to the, the, morphs into something else than it's been established to be since the very beginning. So that's mm. why all well, these questions, one of our former metropolitans said it's one of the, it's if not the critical question of the 20th century was the ecclesiology, yes. the dogma of the church. St. Hilarion famously said that if you admit the existence of the mysteries, and he was talking mainly about the question of baptism, outside the boundaries of the church, the unity of the church cannot stand. Well, you know, that's, there again, it, a lot of words are used of it. Genuine, they use the words uh, effective, uh, validity of uh, the mysteries, etc. These are, you know, these are dogmatic uh, theological points that need to be very clearly defined. People don't understand uh, mm -hmm. uh, what's behind all these things. And if they don't understand it, it, it opens them up to all kinds of you know, possible, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps deception or being misleading uh, ideas. And little by little, people, they lose the salt. That yes. is orthodoxy. Which is the goal of, in every way well, of, the, of the demons. Yes, well, of course, that's what happens. It's, of course, all kinds of divisions, all of this, you know, clearly come from the inspiration of the, the mm. dark powers. Again, ecclesiological and, question. Well, Again, it's... it's the rise if, of a papal, papal mm, uh, ecclesiology in the East now. Well, that's... Unfortunately, uh, it's not just a problem for Roman Catholics if they are trying to be even in some ways devoted to their own uh, thinking, etc. But many, in many cases, the, the Orthodox themselves have, they've adopted some of these errors that many Roman Catholics acknowledge. They say, this is wrong for even us yes. to believe these things, uh, to follow these kind of thinking within our Roman Catholicism. And there are Orthodox so-called theologians who pick up on these things and they parrot them just as well. Mm. which is complete disaster. Mm. We have our own tradition. We have our own legacy. We have our own patristic line and, and fathers that we can turn to, and we need to follow them. We don't need to learn about uh, the church from people outside of the church who are already uh, for a thousand years separated themselves mm. from the church. So we have also a number of challenges that seem to me all fall under the category of ecclesiology. One of them is this latest last three years that we lived through with COVID, COVID, the COVID uh, phenomenon, mm -hmm. uh, and what some people are calling, uh, Father Cosmas in Australia, calling COVIDism, and it's this idea that um, we ought to shut down churches, we need to. Uh, not kiss icons and all that. We need to use multiple spoons. Yeah. Well, how did how did the monastery uh, do well, during the COVID period? Uh, I, I gave 
it could be summed up if you look somewhere on the internet. There's a I gave a, a sermon on Good Friday, on Great Friday. Uh, it was called uh, the um, disinf disinfecting of the sacred. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that you can disinfect something that is sacred so that it, it won't poison you, <laughs> um, which was going on. It was a real thing. Of course, we didn't, we ignored all of that because we, the government's not telling us exactly. Uh, well, maybe it did in some places, but it, it, there was absolutely zero changes in the monastery's practice uh, in all of these areas. Uh, I couldn't think of, quite frankly, anything more offensive to God, anything as to question uh, the, the the ability of God to work through objects, mm -hmm. to say nothing of the holy mysteries, in order to sanctify and save our souls. It, there, it, it, you, it, everything falls apart. If you begin to sow doubt in people's minds and l l l lead them to believe that somehow that they can get poisoned or sick from venerating relics or icons or from receiving communion from the same spoon or things of any of that nature, taking a blessing from the priest because germs will be conveyed or poison or plague from his hand, then you've missed, you've lost exactly what, what's behind all of these things. Mm -hmm. These are all mysteries. These symbols carry uh, the grace of God. And then if you start to disinfect them or something, how are you going to convince people, people after you stop disinfecting them that once again, they can't get sick? Maybe they won't get COVID. Maybe they'll get the flu uh, from something like that. And literally, I believe that the, the Orthodox ethos or the, or the, it will, will break down entirely. People mm -hmm. either lose their faith or their faith has changed mm -hmm. into something else. We become, in the worst sense, materialists. Mm -hmm. And everything is just a symbol. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So none of that we didn't. None of that happened here, and yes, there was a period um, where we, the churches in the Herkimer County, for example, were closed down. But we we uh, learned to navigate uh, through uh, that period. We we the the main churches, the cathedral and the lower church were closed, uh, but we we still were able every Sunday to have five liturgies served mm. in in different venues in order to make sure that <clears throat> the faithful and the community here uh, had access to the holy mysteries and were able to pray in some way or another uh, we we arranged things uh, even giving people the numbers phone numbers of our priests that could come to their house if they were so afraid to even take advantage of the different possibilities that we would commune them at home um, in order to continue church life without any interruption mm. whatsoever, mm. and especially in the way that we conducted the church life. If you did come to a service or were able to get to a service, you would see that nothing had changed, nothing. Why does God allow such challenges to the church? What's What's he going to bring well, out well, of us? The Lord is clearly, he, he's clearly testing us um, to see where you stand on these oh. issues, to mm. see as soon as something happens like that, it right away comes out. How much do you really believe mm -hmm. that this is? If you could, if you could think that you can get poisoned or infected uh, by these things, it means that how much, how strong is your faith to believe that in every, in any circumstance whatsoever, you would not become sick mm -hmm. from things like this. Um, uh, the the blessing of a, a priest or a bishop, it's in the sign of a cross. It's the the name of Christ, and it's the, the it's through the priest. It's conveyed the grace of God through our Lord himself. And what I gave all of the hiero monks in the community and all of our priests, they all had myrrh from the myrrh streaming icon. Mm -hmm. uh, and I told them to anoint their hands with it every day. And I said, this is our disinfectant. And if people think that the mother of God is going to poison them, then everything is, is lost. Mm -hmm. We're all lost. Mm -hmm. And so this is what we did. And recently, a priest came to me yesterday. He said, should I continue anointing my hand? And I said, well, it won't hurt. On her, we have myrrh, thank God. Um, Father Nectarius sent us some more myrrh. Mm. And you know, the, we found ways in order to continue to strengthen the people's faith. Uh, because anything, a step, the slightest step away from that, I consider to be the worst disaster mm. for me personally. It's, I, it's perennially a question of well, trust in God. Well, it? it has to be complete. 
Yes. Yeah. It means you don't believe, you know. And if you don't have, if you have doubts and you have, uh, and your faith is weak, you need to pray. Faith is a virtue; it needs to be struggled for. Cultivate. You know, it cultivate absolutely. It's not a pushing a button. He has more faith; I have less faith. You need to work on it, mm. work on it, build on it, and uh, and pray to God to help you. You know, we saw that famous video of the Greek priest that was in the leper colony. Yes. And uh, he was afraid. At first, when he was assigned, he had to give communion to all the lepers. And and then after that, he has to consume what's left in the chalice. And, you know, that at that moment, he had a moment of, am I going to do this or am I not going to do this? And he said, I'm going to do this. And he communed, he finished the chalice. Um, and then... Uh, his family and the villagers got in line with the lepers and everyone was receiving communion and no one got sick. Mm -hmm. And then they assigned him to a tuberculosis ward, which is even more infectious mm -hmm. and no one got sick, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, and they interviewed his son or grandson or something that it's COVID, you know, would your father, what would your father say in a situation like this? Would he use multiple spoons or something? And the man said, I forget exactly. He had a straw hat on. He says, you know, like, nonsense, nonsense, mm -hmm. that was his answer. Mm -hmm. Because he knew the way that his father dealt with the, the lepers and the and the t tuberculosis uh, clinic there or whatever. So could we say it's something along the lines of according to your faith? Well, it's not according to your faith. You don't have to believe it or not believe it. It's still true. You know, it, it, you mean, have to there, trust. I mean, the, Yes, no, it doesn't. I don't mean it as it's subject, but I mean that you're living out this mystery of the presence of God. Well, the degree that you trust is you increase the, well, the yes, experience. Yes, of course, yes. but it's it's it, you. If you don't believe it, it's still true. Yes, you know it's still true. Uh, but the danger here is that acting on such disbelief, uh, you could you could lose yeah. the grace of God. Yes. You could actually lose it, and or you create an atmosphere. Um, where people themselves, it becomes relative to them. So do if we uh, if someone has fallen into doing practices which uh, clearly express a, a lack of faith in the presence of God and the mysteries, do they need to repent? Well, you know, I'm, we know, of course, we follow, we know what was going on in different places uh, or different uh, means of dealing with COVID, and the situation, I'm not going to comment. I'm not going to judge uh, those people. I'm, I've said what I've said about the way we handle things okay. and the way I think they should be done. And what I believe, it's I think what I've expressed is serious okay. enough uh, to to make clear my position or what I think should be the orthodox position on okay. these things. What, maybe people that did that, maybe they're coming back and they're reviewing, like many people now are beginning to review the actual question of getting vaccinated. I know a lot of people, time has passed, uh, there are certain things going on, some perhaps adverse reactions and all, and people are coming and they're saying, you know, I shouldn't have been vaccinated if I didn't know about this. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, you know, my, my children are getting sick. You, you have Somebody, examples of Well, being... I, I know quite a few people, maybe if we have two seminarians who's Who's uh, who? Fathers got vaccinated. Two weeks later, they dropped dead from from uh, blood clots and things like that. Yeah, I personally know five or six people like that. Um, but I'm not making it. I just it happens to be part of my experience. But um, in the same way with treating the mysteries of the church or the sanctity of the church, people will, you know, maybe think about, you know, what did we do? Did we need to do this? Was it necessary? Mm -hmm. Could we have found another way uh, to do this without, of course? You know exactly breaking the law or getting arrested or going to jail or things like that well of course you have to re anytime we sin or if you acknowledge sin you need to repent you need to repent god yes. will god will forgive and then of course it's very important that the flock uh the flock has to stay on top of these things you can't you know what the lord says if you scandalize one of these little ones it's a terrible sin and how are you going to get their faith? How are you going to convince them that, oh, everything's fine now? You know, they're, they're always going to be a, a, maybe a little bit skeptical about things. Mm -hmm. Once you've opened that door, um, you know, people ask me, I said, well, I would have closed the whole place down rather than give in to any of this. If I was by the law actually forced, then I would have just more, rather than giving in, I would have, cut, I would have closed everything down. We'd, God protected us. 
we had the example of the new martyrs in Cafes mm-hmm. of Russia. How did they handle things? Yes. Yeah. That was, you know, did it remind you? Of, it reminded me in many ways. That's of the, the only, Soviet. Well, it's the only uh, way. I, it's every every time I did something here, I had that in mind. I, I thought, how would they deal with it? How would they deal with all these restrictions? How would they deal with all these close downs, lockdowns, this and that? Uh-huh. I had I had read all the literature available on the Gulag. Uh, on the new martyrs and all, and that was in the back of my mind through the How important in, through the entire process. How it's, important the lives of the saints. Well, absolutely, yeah. they give us they give us ideas about how to handle certain circumstances. I would I don't know what I would have done without. That was very clearly in my mind. Very, it still is. Do you think that that's one of the biggest um, areas that we need to work on as Orthodox in the English speaking world? The the, the the constant pouring over of the lives of recent saints. Well, well, my. Uh, the first spiritual father, Archimedes Kiprian here, and the iconographer, it, when he gave us instructions and all, he would say, you know, take Abba Dorofeus or John of the Latter. He said, this is theory. He said, but the lives of the saints, these is this is life. Mm. This is life. You can read the theory, but you need to read the lives of the saints. We had 12 volumes of the Strugglers for Piety. Mm. Uh, uh, even at that time when they were published in the 18th and 19th century, a number of them, like Blessed Xenia, was there. Well, they, Father Kiprian said to me, all of them are saints. Yeah. All of them are saints. Mm. But they hadn't been glorified. Of course, we were encouraged to read these things yes. Yes. because that's where we see the way they relate to certain mm. circumstances in their lives. And that gives us an idea of what are we going to do? What should we do? If we find ourselves in similar circumstances, the theory, we have to have the theory, but then we get an idea from the lives of the saints. Can you be Orthodox without following the Holy Fathers? Well, you're going to say, can you be Orthodox if you live in the desert without an icon? So does that mean you don't need icons? Or you can't be saved in a cave without an icon? What are we talking about here? Mm. Uh, otherwise, that's a danger to talk like that. That's you get for us, for well, us for, poor Christians. No, for us, yeah. we need to use absolutely everything we have yeah. at our disposal, yeah. because the the climate we live in, it's very clear. That so to repeat it is just repetitive. It's very hostile. We're living very hostile. Uh, we don't get any support from the world around us. None. It's quite the opposite. It's mm. a pressure all the time mm. of one form or another, psychological, through the media, uh, social media, all these things. Uh, the so-called news, if you actually feed into all of that, what, what's being officially presented to us. It's very difficult. St. Saint, uh, Saint Paul gives us you know, the answer to everything uh, in terms of you know, people might not want to hear about the Antichrist or they don't want to hear about globalism or this or that. But globalism, the Antichrist. If you if you if you doubt it, then you doubt Scripture itself. You doubt the Holy Spirit, or you doubt that the what's written by the what the Lord said, what the apostles said, and what is written in the Book of Revelation and the Fathers. You, then you doubt that that's actually true. Mm. Um, so we have to believe because at one day or, or another, it's going to happen. It must happen mm. because it's divine revelation. It will happen. And you look at the end game, and then you understand what's going on right now mm-hmm. in the world. You don't have to be preoccupied with all of this, uh, tracing all of this, but you just need to be aware. But St. Paul, he sums it up very quick, very easily in one sentence uh, in his writing about the end, which he needed to address because the people got hysterical and they thought the end was coming any day. And he said, first, this, 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 this has to happen. And he talked about when he when he actually wrote about the Antichrist, St. Paul said it happens like this. He described uh, how it happens. He said, first, he said, people will lose their love for the truth. In other words, they will not be interested in discerning what is true and what is false. Mm. He says that first. And then he makes like a comment, a comma, and he goes further. He goes further and he says, and because they're not interested anymore in discerning the truth, he says that God will send them a spirit of delusion so that they will be deluded, but it'll be their own fault. Mm-hmm. And then there's another comment. And he says, so that in order that they will believe a lie, period. And that's it. That how it works. Mm-hmm. First, you lose an interest in discerning what's true. Mm-hmm. People say it doesn't matter or something like that, or they're indifferent. And then the, because of the result, they get del- they're deluded. They're in, in delusion. Mm-hmm. And in that kind of state, they'll believe a lie. Mm. And 
Saint Theophan Theod- the Recluse, he also talks about and when he interprets Saint Paul, he says at the end, he says there'll be no more royal power, there will be no more monarchies, which sounded odd in the middle of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. He says the whole world will be covered by democracies and republics, Mm -hmm. which was hard to believe back then, Mm -hmm. but he was a prophet. And he says the Antichrist will come because there'll be no one person to say, and he goes into Latin, he says veto. Mm -hmm. See, Mm -hmm. because the people are making the decision, but the people are deluded, Mm -hmm. you see. (laughs) So what kind of decision can they make? that will be, you know, in any way spiritually, you know, useful mm-hmm. um, or salvific because it's, this is what's happening. So this is what we're living through now. I, I was going to say, don't, doesn't this remind us of our own days? Well, of course it is. This the is vast like, majority of people oh, don't believe in truth at well, all. Well, they don't care. Nobody's interested. You, whatever you throw at them. And if you don't believe it today, after a while, you'll get used to it. And eventually you will believe it. You'll get used to it and say, okay, I didn't like that 10 years ago, but now I can see mm. that this is, oh, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But it's not okay. It's not okay. Indeed. Thank you so much. You're You're welcome. Your your grace for joining us. Thank you. Your blessing. Yes, God bless.